Um, I uh, was just... moment. Oh, now it's now the recording is started. Okay, so we, now we're on for the recording. Let me just drop a few words before uh, we kick off. Uh, so that was a um, spring project, basically, with Andrei Kisitsin and Alia Novikova. Um, and our aim was just to write some of the basic uh, tensor operations, like you would find in Aten, but obviously not the whole of Aten uh, in PyTorch. Uh, just some of the most useful ones in a uh, multi-platform um, framework for Kotlin. So that basically you could prototype or use it, or if you have not a very demanding application, absolutely everywhere where Kotlin uh, Kotlin target is is available. Um, we might take it further. We might think how we can uh, we can combine it uh, with uh, more powerful frameworks. Um, uh, maybe we should think about how we could um have some protocol for the data for the neural networks and for something else to be able to run it on different uh, for those different targets but so far it was more of a experiment experimental approach um and it's something that um that i think paid off and we we ended up with quite a rich uh, api for working with tensors and i would like now those who created this uh interesting products to speak about it uh, in particular Alia will um will uh, tell you a bit about broadcasting because that's not always maybe uh, very familiar for people not coming from a python background uh how she implemented it and uh, she then will discuss about uh, the specific singular value decomposition implementation that we focused on um uh, for our library uh and then andre um We'll, uh, we'll run through a few examples, uh, including actually the PCA, uh, and the linear regression. So kind of kind of good models um, that cover a lot actually in machine learning. Um, and actually even a small, small, but quite cool, I think, uh, neural network um, examples. So let's give them uh, the stage and Thank you. And yes, they will be speaking Russian. Then, um, sorry, they will be speaking actually English. They are not native English speakers, obviously. So please, if you ask questions, try to sp uh, speak um, slowly and wait every single word so that uh, they can <laughs> understand and smoothly explain. You can it. actually ask questions in Russian, and uh, I or Roland. Will yeah, we, we try not to kind of translate, but yeah, if 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 you do speak English, just kind of. Um, um, it is great that they make the effort to speak in English and that we can sort of uh, have a broader audience uh, to listen uh, to this interesting topic. So, okay, uh, come on, Alia, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. While Alia is turning her screen on, uh, yeah, the disclaimer. The whole work is uh, somehow sponsored by the JetBrains Research Foundation. So I had to, <laughs> to, to say that. Yeah, so can you see my screen? Yes. 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 OK. It's better to switch to, pre uh, to presentation mode, view presentation mode, because otherwise it will be hard to see in the recording. Right now it's OK, but in recording it will be. Maybe it's like this, because uh, it's not. Uh... Okay, you, you can you can use it. She has some slides as well, so it's okay. Okay, then coming on. Okay, so uh, our module provides basic linear functions and basic linear algorithms over tensors, and uh, I want to tell you about some of these functions. So let's start with some very basic functions. Uh, the tensor algebra file contains functions that define algebra over tensors, uh, that is, this is plus, minus, um, element-wise multiplication, matrix multiplication, and etc. Uh, and almost all of these functions are implemented in two versions. Uh, there is a usual simple version where the input tensors have the same shape, uh, or in the case of matrix multiplication, the input tensors have the same dimensions over which the multiplication takes place. 
Uh, and um, there is also a version with broadcasting. So uh, all broadcast implementations are in the broadcast double tensor algebra file. Uh, and uh, broadcasting uh, works in a similar way uh, to the classic one, such as in the NumPy or PyTorch libraries. And let's start with the standard multi-shape broadcasting uh, that is used uh, for all element-wise functions like plus, minus, and so on. Uh, this broadcasting is very often used, for example, when we want to add matrix and vector. Uh, is my presentation visible? Yeah, fine. Okay. So let's look at the picture. We have um, a three by three matrix and a vector of length three. We want to add them. This happens in a natural way. We just add this vector to each row of the matrix. And in general, um, this example, so this shape of one tensor and this shape of second tensor, and this is result shape. Uh, and in general, perhaps the most frequent use of such broadcasting is precisely the replacement of dimension one by some larger dimension. Uh, if we want to add some small object with larger one, then we seem to copy the small object in all missing or unit dimensions and then add it element by element. And um, this is informally speaking, we add a small object several times to a larger one in all the necessary dimensions. And formally, broadcasting for the two shapes is defined as follows. So the shape with fewer dimensions is complemented by unit dimensions on the left until the number of dimensions is uh, aligned. Uh, and then two shapes of the same size try to overlap uh, where the dimensions is equal to one, for example, here. Um, uh, we just, um, so it seems like, to, it seems to be copied and becomes equal to the larger dimensions. And if, for example, here, uh, we're not one or five, then such tensors would not be able to broadcast. Okay, uh, and so accordingly in all element by element functions, we first bring tensors to the same shape. Okay, and um, there is yeah, this function. Um, there is a broadcast shape function uh, that takes several shapes as input uh, and it runs over them and select the maximum for each dimensions. And then it replaces the unit dimensions with the maximum. Okay. Uh, another type of broadcast is needed to for operations of mat matrices. Um, that is when we represent a tensor exactly as a set of matrices. Let's consider the example of matrix multiplication. Uh, we have this slide. Uh, we have two tensors and all matrix operation are performed uh, with the last two di dimensions. And the last two dimensions must correspond to the operation. That is, for example, sometimes they must be equal. In our case, this dimension uh, should be the same. To multiply mat matrices, we need to, um, we need the matrix to be of the form NP by MP, or NM by MP. Uh, and so that is, we have uh, one set of matrices and the second set of matrices. So th this is their shapes. Uh, and everything in front of the uh, last two dimensions we broadcast. In this case, the result will be J, K. We replaced the unit dimension with them. And the last two dimensions of the result depend on the specific function over matrices. Um, in our case, we have matrix multiplication, so NP by MP, and M by MP uh, turns out NP. 
Okay, and mm, this function. Um, yes, so this function does just that. Uh, it takes all dimensions um, except the last two and brings them to a common view similar to regular bro broadcasting. And uh, I think this, yeah, this function. So finally, I want to tell you about one of the key algorithm in our model. Uh, the S SVD algorithm, and here the uh, iterative SVD algorithm is implemented. So briefly about the idea of this algorithm um, definition, the sigma number is called the singular number of, of the matrix X, if and only if um, there are um, right and left singular vectors such that uh, this equality holds. Sigma is a singular number, A and B are singular vectors. And sing singular ve value decomposition of matrix M is such a decomposition into three matrices, U, Sigma and V, such that U and V are unary consisting of left and right singular vectors, and Sigma is diagonal and has singular numbers on the diagonal. And let us rewrite this decomposition in a slightly different form here in this. So the idea of the algorithm is um, at each iteration we approximate the matrix X by the product of two vectors A and B. The search for the best approximation is performed using the uh, least squares method. Uh, that is, we want to minimize this formula. And we, um, if we equate it to zero, then we can express vector A in terms of B and vector B in terms of vector A. Uh, therefore, as an initial approximation of, of the vector A, we take a random vector of unit length, calculate the vector B, then for this vector B, we calculate the vector A, and etc. And we stop, for example, uh, when we approach zero with a certain accuracy, epsilon, which we set in advance. And as a result, we got the best approximation by the matrix P1, uh, further from the matrix X, we subtract the resulting matrix P1. And for the resulting matrix of um, deviations X, uh, X1, we again look for the best approximation P2 of the same time, and etc. Uh, until, for example, the norm XK becomes uh, sufficiently small. So um, as a result, we obtained an iterative um, procedure for decom decomposing the matrix X in the form of a sum of matrices. And from the decomposition, we can find the SVD decompos decomposition. Uh, singular number are calculated using uh, this formula. And singular vectors are just AI and BI. Okay, so I think yeah, this function and yeah, this uh, SVD1D, uh, this function just describes the search for one decompos decomposition into vectors A and B. Uh, first, we take a random vector of uh, unit length, then we uh, iteratively bring the product closer to the origin uh, matrix, and we end if the error is small. Uh, and uh, here, um, this is where the iterations themselves take place. We subtract our approximation from the origin matrix, and we repeat everything for the resulting matrix. Yeah, so the SVD algorithm 
uh, itself uh, receives a tensor as input um, and presents it as a set of matrices. That is the decomposition itself. Alia, uh, our yeah. listener asked to increase the font size or switch to uh, presentation mode. View presentation mode in the menu of uh, idea. View. Yeah, okay. View uh, appearance and presentation mode. No, no, no. The, the top oh, one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It should be much better. Yeah, okay. So we. Um, so the decomposition occurs many times uh, in the last two dimensions of our tensor. And accordingly, a larger tensor is returned, uh, which contains the SVD decomposition for such a set of matrices. Yeah, and I think on this I finish. And I can give the floor to Andrei. Uh, I think first it's better to, uh, maybe there are some questions about the first part. At least I, I have a question. Maybe someone, anybody else have a question as well. Any questions? No questions. Okay, then I have a question since I had time to look into the implementation. Uh, Brendan, nice hat. Uh, okay, uh, I looked into implementation right now. Uh, you use uh, this algebra for broadcasting. Uh, it's separate from the basic al algebra as requested, but right now it's stateless. So basically it seems like right now it is possible to somehow enhance these uh, possibility, uh, capabilities by using like broadcast uh, uh, along some specific axis, not general broadcasting, but specific broadcasting. Have you thought about it? Sorry, uh, about what functions? Well, I mean, I mean, right now the broadcasting is yeah. general. I mean, uh, it's like it doesn't depend on on the shapes or specific. Um, it works the same way for any tensor, but okay. the current design allows more flexibility actually because. In inside the algebra, I mean the your broadcast uh, tensor algebra or how, how it's called. Yes, but broadcast double tensor algebra. You are able to provide axis specific axis alongside which you do a broadcasting. It seems like it gives more flexibility. Uh, you want this feature? You mean? I'm not sure. I, I'm asking if it if it makes any uh, sense. Well, I mean, normally there are some specific rules that Ali uh, described uh, that typically libraries like NumPy, Torch, TensorFlow follow for broadcasting tensors. Um, then, yes, the decision we made because uh, broadcasting obviously introduces uh, runtime problems. You, you can't quite, from just at compile time, understand whether that, that will work or not. I mean, sort of speaking, uh, we decided to, to distinguish uh, those two implementations um, and uh, then forbid any type of broadcasting in one implementation and, um, and allow you for sort of more and safer use uh, to, to run it when you specifically call the context where you want to broadcast. But then uh, leaving the... Uh, leaving the user the opportunity to sort of broadcast at different dimensions. In practice, this is something wrong to do because normally the user, if you follow the broadcasting rules, you can always reshape the tensor in a way which will force the broadcasting to go one way or another, which is actually sort of 80% of the time NumPy developers, I mean, people using NumPy spend, sort of reshape the, the tensor the NumPy array or the tensor in a way that they sort of glue together in a nice way. Uh, so you can always achieve that. And I think we rather have a few rules um, that are more or less well documented or understood that you have to follow to get your, your feature instead of trying to chase the users to kind of get the features they want. Um, mm -hmm. So that's my approach. I just want to take uh, Alexei's uh, question. No, we don't. That's the main. Uh, point. You should this probably is a multi-platform 
it's a fully multi-platform, Kotlin multi-platform implementation. The guys coded everything from zero. So no, I just spoke about that end because that was our initial sort of. Uh, we obviously haven't implemented all of the all of the features, obviously that are available in Aten. It's a huge library, um, but some of the important features we implemented, and this is implemented from zero in a in a uh, common in a common source code. So yeah, so that's from zero, and uh, the way. Uh, sort of a byproduct of that is that our philosophy here is about functionality and prototyping rather than performance because if you want performance then you do go and use a 10 or the bindings uh, to a 10 or whatever um yes. so for us it's really about being able to to kind of run run things whenever you just want to run them for a small uh for a small application so that's why we offer svd because svd covers most of I mean, SVD calls really a lot of algorithms in machine learning. So if you have that, you can play around. And then uh, I propose you to kind of move on with with, uh, with Andre because he's going to show you a bit of more examples where actually the functionality we implemented is a quite good is a quite good thing to to do some some basic machine learning. Uh, which uh, yeah, which the cool thing about all of that is that you can run it everywhere Kotlin can sort of produce a target so so let's yes. move on with andre and then at, at the end if uh, maybe uh, any qu any other questions no no questions oh brandon if you are to talking we do not hear you please turn on your microphone it's blinking but it's not turned on so while, while brandon fights with his microphone uh okay <laughs> he stopped fighting with the microphone <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, answer to Alexei's question that uh, the question was basically the several questions that basically uh, if we are going to use the same interfaces to wrap a native implementations like Torch. Yes, exactly. We've started with a co pure Kotlin implementation uh, mostly for that, just to understand what constructs are look uh, does look better in Kotlin, and where then use those interfaces to wrap uh, native uh, constructs. Otherwise, we'll be um, restricted to. Um, okay, we we have two Brendans now, and we do not hear any of them. <laughs> either of them. Okay. okay oh. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah the, the, the SVD yes is uh, is available in C plus plus and it's actually available in Kotlin through the branch I have of the binding, which is, however, not quite ready for this. Okay, Brendan, your oh, question. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentation, Elia. Um, uh, just curious uh, if if you um, uh, allow users to implement like different solvers. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm for the the PCA, I mean, uh, you imagine you could like do Gauss-Newton kind of iterative gradient descent type method or like a more power iteration. Uh, no, Brandon, this is a bit more advanced. Uh, we just offer some basic linear algebra. Um, if you, so Andre was going to talk about how he approached uh, PCA. So he's going to use a function called sym symmetric CMEG. CMEG exists in Torch actually, and we sort of follow this philosophy. So the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of symmetric metrics. Under the hood, it uses this SVD uh, decomposition. Uh, and uh, uh, also, I I went for a, so SVD has different algorithms as well. There's a more there's a deterministic one. There's a power, and uh, I think it's cool that we went for the power because depending on your epsilon, because you you want maybe sometimes a not very great epsilon, say just two orders, and then you get some sort of results and not just in, enough for your, or if you want to be very precise, but then allow more time for the algorithm to turn. So you can play around with that. So that's why it was uh, maybe initially, okay. obviously power method is slower than deterministic SVD, but it allows you in some situations to, to consume less CPU if you don't need that crazy precision in, in your results. I see. Yeah, thanks. Um, makes sense. Uh, Let's move on with Andrea, I guess, because okay. <laughs> running, to, running out of time.
Andre, are you here? Um, okay, now we hear you and even see um, something. Yes. yes, we see you. Um, hello, I am Andre or Andrew. Um, can you see uh, Jupyter Notebook? Yes, yes, perfectly fine. Okay. You can, oh, again, you maybe can increase a bit just in, in your browser, in, increase uh, the scale a bit. Oh, okay. You can also I, enter in, in a full screen mode in, in Chrome, uh, if it's Chrome. Uh, yeah, it's Chrome. I think it's okay. But it's okay. Yeah, wonderful. Um, uh, okay. Our library provides classical methods for linear algebra as well as basic methods for data analysis. Let's have a look um, at what is on offer with some uh, examples. Uh, how about starting with data normalization and principal component analysis, PCA? Um, take an independent uh, variable X, for example, uh, ranging uh, from zero to nine. Uh, function function from array uh, is a common way to create a tensor with a given shape and elements. The variable i will depend linearly on x uh, up to Gaussian noise. The random normal like uh, method just does that for us. It returns a tensor with the same shape as a cold tensor with elements from normal distribution. Um, stack them into a single tensor. Um, okay, now we want to perform dimension reduction on our data set using PCA. First, let's normalize the data. Um, the mean and STD methods will help us with this. Uh, this uh, functions calculate uh, the mean and standard deviation uh, of the tensor elements. Um, uh, subtract uh, the mean, uh, divide by deviation, and save these values uh, for further recovery. Um, now let's um, calculate uh, cover uh, covariation um, matrix um, of uh, X and Y. Oh, I sorry. Um, it's easy to see for me that they are really highly correlated. Um, now let's calculate the uh, eigenvector of the matrix using the CMAC function, which calculates an eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the uh, symmetric matrix. Um, by multiplying the tensor of the uh, normalized X and I by one of the eigenvectors, we project the data onto the space spanned by it. Um, uh, we can restore the original data, assuming all projections. But we can reduce uh, dimensionality by keeping only few of the vectors. Um, and in our case, we project the data onto a single one with the largest eigenvalue. Um, Okay, we uh, have reduced our uh, data. Um, now let's have a look, for example, on the seventh row. Take the seventh row of the projected data, take its product with the eigenvector, multiply um, the result uh, with STD, um, add the mean. And uh, as you can see, the reconstruction is quite accurate 
as the data set was highly correlated uh, initially. Uh, just a little comment. So you see, uh, Alex, uh, he uh, cell 98, he's using view, the view function to actually express how he wants the broadcasting to happen. Um, that's the normal way we, we typically do that. So yes, uh, my thought was just uh, it's how you do it in Python, but uh, we are not restricted to that. Uh, also, it's a good thing we can actually create different ways of representing broadcasting without breaking something because it's encapsulated in this algebra. But it's just a thought for the future. Okay, and just, sorry. Uh, sir, carry on, Andre. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, another useful example is the least square method performed using singular value decomposition. Um, consider a linear model in which i equals the vector product of alpha uh, and x. So let's generate an alpha. Um, In this example, we will take it from the normal distribution um, using the uh, random normal function. It returns a tensor of given shape with elements from a normal distribution with zero mean and uh, standard uh, deviation one. Uh, I uh, changed uh, means. Um, by using constant, uh, constant vector. Um, now let's um, generate uh, uh, a sample uh, for x, uh, also from normal distribution, and, uh, and calculate uh, uh, y. Um, and add a uh, white noise. Uh, okay, now knowing x and uh, uh, i, we should estimate the alpha using the ordinary least squares method. Uh, to do this, we need uh, to get a singular value decomposition uh, of the matrix uh, x. We can get it using uh, the uh, SVG method. Um, Uh, it returns the singular values of the matrix as well as the matrices u and v, uh, such the product of u, uh, sigma, and v transposed is equal to the original matrix, where sigma is a matrix with singular values uh, on the diagonal. Um, first, uh, let's make sure that all singular values are not close to zero. Um, uh, that's okay. Um, um, now we get um, the inverse of, of the uh, formatted sigma matrix using the, the diagonal embedding uh, function, which returns the diagonal matrix with the given elements on diagonal, um, passes the numbers uh, inverse to the singular values and get the desired matrix. Um, by multiplying uh, the V, uh, the sigma, uh, the transpose U and I, we get our alpha estimate. As you can see, it's pretty close to the original alpha. Um, Let's calculate the mean um, squared error of our approximation. Uh, to do this, we calculate the vector of the difference between the prediction and the real values, multiply it by itself, and divide by the, resu the result by the it length. Um, as you can see, the error is quite small. In general, by adding regularization, we can get a full-fledged rich regression this way. Um, <clears throat> okay, now consider an example solving a system of linear 
uh, equitations using the LU decomposition. Uh, for convenience, I added the coefficients and the correct uh, solution manually. Um, now let's find the solution um, to the system uh, uh, a dot x equal b using the LUP decomposition on matrix A, uh, we are left uh, with uh, solving um, two systems with lower triangular and upper triangular matrix. Um, that is uh, LUP decomposition. We can um, make sure that um, p dot a equal l dot u and l is upper or lower triangular and u is upper triangular um, so there are formulas uh, for solution um, we have to solve a system uh, with uh, lower triangular and upper triangle matrices. Um, um, uh, let's write the function uh, solve LT, which solves the system for the lower triangular matrix. Uh, to do this, we will find the elements of the solution um, iteratively. Um, um, now, um, we need to solve a similar problem, but for an upper triangular matrix. Uh, let's reduce uh, the system to a lower triangular matrix system. Uh, to do this, we need the uh, RevMat uh, permutation matrix with ones on the diagonal. It's uh, done in the following way. And uh, we can get solution of the system with the matrix U. Um, let's look at the solution. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, let's look at the solution we found of the general system. And as you can see, it completely uh, coincides with the correct answer. Okay, uh, I finished with uh, the first part. Uh, any question? Yeah, any questions or questions? Yes. Is, is the, the only remark I have, but this is for Jupyter developers, is that we do have those with this context-oriented programming. It will be nice to have those contexts to be somehow implicit. Uh, yes. uh, I, I, I was sure somebody was going to ask this. There are actually two ways of doing this. Uh, we can uh, bo both both involve uh, creating a plugin uh, for that. So uh, the the. The easiest way is do it like we did in the Kima for real or even include it there. So you just create a top level extensions that mirror those internal uh, functions uh, and it works only when you load a specific library. Uh, and another one is Jupyter specific. It, uh, it could be done. I already contacted uh, uh, Ilya Murdayan about that. We in, it is in theory possible to create to use an implicit receiver for a cell. So one uh, uses some kind of command, some kind of magic in the Jupyter, and then all other cell implicitly use this object as a receiver. And you do not have to do this. 
anyway, we will solve it uh, both ways. Uh, the first one we can do on our side, and it's quite simple to do. The second one requires some help from the Jupyter team, but anyway, we will do it. Uh, it is perfectly doable. A remark from Alexei. Uh, uh, that that uh, he likes the overloaded operations, like, but he reserve doesn't support addition of new operators. I'm not sure what what you mean. Uh, it's it's just strongly discouraged to create a global overload of arithmetical operations. Yes, it is. This is why this is exactly why in K math uh, those overrides are not global. They are local to this algebra. This is the idea. And this is basically solves uh, the problem which may raises the concern in uh, for Aman Yelizarov and other, other developers. The problem when different uh, operators start to conflict with each other and it's not clear which one will be used. Okay, uh, Andre, you have something else to report? Uh, yes, uh, if there are no questions. Let's move on to the second part. Um, um, this example, I wrote an experimental implementation of neural network. It's a multi-layer uh, neural network trained with the backpropagation training method. Um, first, let's uh, define the layers. Um, the layer has a function function forward which calculates the output of the layer and backward func function for the calculating the gradient um, um, uh, there is activation layer um, interface I have moved the activation functions into separate layers there are two such layers um, with uh, corresponding functions uh, relu and sigmoid um, also uh, there is a classical dense layer um, now let's define uh, the neural network. Um, uh, we take uh, log softmax uh, as a last function. Um, this um, method uh, calculates its gradient for a batch of logits data and valid labels. Um, uh, we um, do train. Um, Uh, no, do the fit uh, using the uh, mini batch stochastic gradient descent method. The eternal um, uh, um, the eternal uh, iter batch uh, method allows us to get randomly shaded batches uh, on which we will train. Um, uh, let's move on to using the above. Um, generating features from a normal distribution with different mean. Uh, we will simulate the binary classification problem. The predicate is pretty simple. If the sum of features uh, is, po is positive, um, then the class is one and otherwise uh, is zero. Um, um, leave uh, some data uh, for test or validation. Um, build our model. Um, feed our model with train data. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, and um, oh, uh, let's uh, uh, check uh, accuracy on uh, validation. Um, predict uh, returns uh, logics. Uh, so we need uh, the argmax uh, function. Uh, uh, as you can see, it works um, pretty well. Okay, um, that's all. Any questions here? Okay, Brandon? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, Andre, uh, this is uh, this looks really neat. Um, uh, you mentioned a little bit about, your, about the optimizer as well. I'm kind of curious here. Maybe um, uh, have you looked into like momentum, or uh, maybe you could use uh, like a little bit faster um, uh, gradient descent method. I don't know. Did did that? Uh, so maybe like you. Uh, uh, at a grad or uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess Andre, you can tell us, but it, he just we, this is not part of the library. He he just used the tensor API we had to actually uh, write himself his own back propagation. So we don't so we don't so he doesn't use any um, so we don't have like this optimizer class that you have in PyTorch, for example. Uh, so it's all he he coded even the 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 forward pass and the backward pass himself. Uh, although we do have Kotlin Grad obviously integrated with uh, KMAT, the thing is that we wanted to stay absolutely uh, multi-platform for all the examples. Yeah. Um, and um, of course, on the GVM we could try to integrate with your library for for creating the back backward pass uh, and uh, uh, other, otherwise the whole point of this example was also to demonstrate that we have somehow achieved a quite rich API even though it's pretty small um, to for you to be able to run those type of uh, small um, small neural networks and some small machine learning applications including in the browser yes you have tensorflow GS today but this thing enables you to kind of write those little things absolutely for everything and then being able to kind of just send it everywhere you want um and use it everywhere so that's that's a cool thing about it i think uh but yeah. then if you have, want to full-fledged full functional uh, deep learning uh api and kotlin multi-platform i'm not sure this yeah I'm, yeah, I, I I kind of there is a use case to actually bring more functionality into the multi-platform. In particular, maybe being able to serve, having a nice protocol be behind, you know, uh, sort of um, sort of exchanging data for um, for the for the data involved in the model. Uh, uh, it, it's more than just say, for example, uh, um, than just doing an inference because many many applications you need online learning you need transfer learning you need uh, you, you want to train the model basically uh on the client side so it's not just uh it's not just something that uh, that you know you you once trained on a huge google cloud you know uh box uh, and then you sort of ship around this model everywhere no i think and more, more and more you have like these applications when you probably don't want to exchange data with the network you don't just want to do it on the client side on the client machine and so those little things those, this little functionality already enables you to kind of recreate some good functionality um and uh, obviously if we add more it will be more attractive but i think there is a critical point where you will start to wonder was you want to run a massive network on a multi-platform uh, and multi-platform because you at some point you just really need the GPU to kind of do those things and uh, yes yeah, yeah. so it's um, uh, 
but I think like I, I I could see see a use case for that. I mean, uh, I think it's um, uh, you know it showed some examples here. But, but this is yeah all from zero. Uh, this has been coded from sort of from zero everything. So yeah. that was the whole point. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, still he managed to kind of classify ninety almost ninety six percent. Good, good, Andre. Actually, uh, we can do some things right now because uh, we've done all this schema framework. Uh, one of the main reasons is to allow us to use functionality from different libraries together with the same API. And we, thanks to Yaroslav here, we also already have this uh, Kotlin Grad, for example, uh, collection model. And we can do automatic differentiation, and we actually can do it with tensors. So we can take tensor from here, from uh, the uh, API that Roland and uh, Andre and Dada created, and then move it to Kotlin Rat environment and uh, perform uh, automatic differentiation and move it back. So right now, we are at the beginning and we need to study those possibilities but i've done similar things for example moving objects um, around between matrix libraries some our own matrix libraries and for example com commons math uh, automatic differentiation tools so it is possible because we use common interfaces for example uh, the great achievement here is that all this tensor machinery uses basic and uh, structure and D interface underneath, which could be used with the uh, other KMath models as well. Mm -hmm. Like like you do in the NumPy, for example, with the in the arrays, but in the array is an implementation, and here we have an interface. Yeah, because I know with, with like NumPy, they I think they might lower onto blast in some cases. Um, uh, but then you know, I, I don't know if, if you need that uh, necessarily. I, I, there's other features that you might want, like um, uh, there's some libraries for uh, sparsification and, uh, and you know, handling. Um, like, uh, like one reason I could see you might want to do this at a higher level is if you want to have like symbolic, symbolic um, matrices or, or tensors. And so there, um, you know, maybe you have a, uh, an easier, uh, job of expressing this in a higher level language, but um, yeah, I, I, I guess I guess there's different paths to to actually running this. Maybe yeah, Yaroslav has some thoughts there, but it seems like you know the kind of eager evaluation, you know, just run whatever the user writes is the simplest, most straightforward thing to do. I'm yeah. not sure if uh, Andre or Roland have some comments, but actually we have great plans here because uh, uh, the this torch uh, site, uh, automatic differentiation and other tools is one thing, but now we can do a lot of things on the Kotlin site as well. For example, symbolic automatic differentiation, which does not require uh, torch or whatever. And I right now I am using those tools to recreate the Troitsky mass analysis, which requires a fitting of complicated functions. And I'm doing implementing some uh, very complicated uh, optimization tools for uh, multivariate optimization. And of course, it requires a lot of work to bring it all together and to understand how it works together. Um, yeah, and anyway, all of the examples you've seen from Andre are available in the examples module uh, in KMAT if you want to have a look at the code. At the code. And um, I, I, Andre also um, uh, uh, published this uh, repository on his, on, on his GitHub. I will maybe drop a link on Slack later um, uh, if, if you want to have a look. Uh, and obviously, as I said before, um, if you need performance, if you want performance, if you know what you're doing and you know what kind of machine you're running on, then yes, you want to use the, the tools that are, are available. Uh, otherwise, 
uh, there are many use cases where you want to have a multi-platform sort of target sort of completely um, write code completely unaware of where it's going to be run uh, and you don't need massive uh, performance then this library might might be appealing to you and we hope also that some people will also join and try to make it better as well with us um, we obviously try to move on with it as well we'll add uh, more feature going forward uh, as we actually also work on getting PyTorch integrating integrated maybe TensorFlow also into this tensor sort of uh, philosophy uh, that we have in KMAT and uh, yeah so that's my closing remarks and I would like to thank Andrea and Alia for for a really hard work um, uh, they're just uh, third year third year stu undergrad students yeah uh, from Peter St Petersburg um and it was yes it was a spring um spring internship by uh, jet brands so thanks to them as well for for helping us to to run those type of things and yeah um hope you enjoyed the talk and thank you very much to everyone thank you i can uh, also add that it was a great report both from alia and andre and it's very good quality and i want to and i think this as well so well done guys uh we had to actually <laughs> try to push them to run this in english and not in russian and i, I think it paid off and it was nice yes, yes it's quite uh, nice it was, yeah, useful for other people to actually listen to your talk so thank you Yes, and thank you, Roland, for the yeah. yeah, supervision <laughs> of this project. It was uh, superb, I think. Thank you. Okay, then maybe that's all for today. Uh, bye, everyone. Goodbye.